Let's go to the maps, the ones that will affect Florida's political landscape for years to come. State lawmakers head back to Tallahassee Tuesday. Their version of redistricting vetoed by the governor in an unprecedented move. Now they're going to be considering another version of the maps drawn by the governor's direction that will likely affect the strength of minority voters and the balance of power in Congress. At issue here, districts that are fair, compact, and equitable, and protect minority voices. Democratic State Senator Jason Pizzo of North Miami and Republican Senator Jeff Randis of St. Petersburg have been immersed in the redistricting process. They're on opposite sides of the aisle, but they often find ways to work together, and we're glad to have them together this morning. Senators, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Jason Pizzo, if I may uh, begin with you, but Jeff Brandis, want to hear you on this too. Uh, the governor certainly has the right, the power to veto the congressional redistricting maps put before him, but he has never before had the power to draw those maps. Why did the legislature abdicate its responsibility and give him the power to do it? Because most of my re Republican colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I'll make an exception for my buddy Jeff, uh, coward or whatever the governor wants. He, he has very high approval ratings. He's got a war chest for his uh, campaign reelection. And it's uh, the worst kept secret that he'll threaten primaries uh, and, and, and people's basic uh, political livelihood going forward. I, I guess, Jeff, Brandis, the other side of that coin would be, um, well, according to the governor, his people actually worked with the legislative map makers to come up with something he's got to sign off on anyway. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, absolutely. Listen, at the end of the day, he gets the he gets the yes or no vote as to his veto pen or not. Uh, and so ultimately, you know, largely the legislature is left to looking at the maps and determining whether the maps that he presented are constitutional. Uh, and I think there are benefits, uh, as I've seen to his some of his some of his maps. For example, my city now has potentially two congressmen, which I think is obviously better than one. So there are benefits for individual members. But I think we have to look, obviously, at the state as a whole. Yeah, uh, Jeff Brandis, uh, the map, the last one we saw, there have been several iterations here, but the last map we saw from the governor's office had 20 congressional districts going to the Republicans, your party, in Florida, and eight going to the Democrats. And just on a basis of fairness, that doesn't seem fair in, in a state that Donald Trump won by 3% of the vote in 2020. Well, I don't think you can look at it like we're drawing, you know, one way or the other. I think ultimately the question is, are the districts constitutional? Are they compact enough? Uh, do they do they look like uh, the state of Florida? Uh, and are they are they situated in such a way that they meet constitutional and statutory uh, muster? And so I think that's really what the question is. It's what we're going to be asking the attorneys and other professionals who do this every day uh, to, to help us make that determination as we go into special session this week. All right, so let's do some really plain talk here. The map, for, for everyone watching, this is the most eye-glazing topic for television <laughs> ever, but so critical for every single person watching. And the districts, if we, let's put up some maps and show what the districts are going to look like and why the lines are important and the gerrymandering, the wild lines that that the, the people in power can put in to protect their own voting, that's gone, presumably. So the governor comes up with a map that says he's getting rid of what was gerrymandering to benefit a racial minority block. He wants race neutral, those were his words, quote unquote, race neutral voting. The Florida Constitution actually makes compact and contiguous uh, a law when drawing the maps. However, the, the U.S. Voting Rights Act does have an eye toward protecting minority votes, both race and language minority votes. So both of you take on, Jason, let's start with you. How do we protect minority votes and make this race neutral? Is that a thing? It is a thing, and it's a thing we need to be mindful of. Uh, you know, just I want to just put this in context, sort of separation of, of powers here. The Secretary of State in a lawsuit that's open right now against the maps that we did pass, uh, the Secretary of State has asked the court to put basically put a stay on those proceedings on the litigation challenging those maps because, quote, the legislature's responsibility is to draft maps for reapportionment for congressional seats, and yet we haven't. 
We're, we're being spoon fed something the governor has given us. Glenna, we're going to go from distinctly and objectively four performing black congressional districts just to two, 20 and 24. The governor said we're not going to have a 200 mile long gerrymander. And yet the proposed 18th congressional district goes from Polk in the northwest all the way down to Hendry, it, you know, to the southeast. That's 180 miles long. And while, you know, Senator Brandis talks about splitting, it's nice to have two, you know, to hedge. But basically, you know, we're jumping over large swaths of water to go grab and to try to dilute minority representation. So we're going from four to two objectively in black performing. He says we're not going to have a 200 mile gerrymander, but it's going to be 180 miles wide uh, on another one. It's OK there, just not up there. And remember, we passed 8019 version 8019 in the maps which did not have a 200 mile long gerrymander as, as he classifies it. it actually was compact into the Duval area that was presented to him and he vetoed that. Yeah, uh, uh, Jeff Brandis, uh, Governor DeSantis the other day when he was in Miami was talking about race neutral di districts and he cited as sort of the defense for doing this, a 2017 US Supreme Court decision that said the North Carolina General Assembly had violated the 14th Amendment, uh, equal protection by drawing a couple of districts that allowed a black candidates to be elected. In fact, they were elected. And he says, we've got to be, you know, in, in lockstep with the U.S. Supreme Court on that, dis on that decision. Uh, is that really sort of the prevailing legal moment we're in? Well, look, I think there's no doubt that these maps are immediately going to enter into court and, and ultimately likely to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, I think these these maps are going to be challenged day one. The, the current maps that we have, which, you know, passed overwhelm with overwhelming support, and we believe were constitutional as well, were challenged. So I don't think there's any way that we're going to end without being challenged. Uh, that's going to work itself through the courts. Uh, and, you know, when I was first elected in 2012, all our maps were thrown out and I had to run again in a new district in 2014. Right. So I, I won't be surprised if these things end in court and there are some changes to the lines going forward. All right. When, when you two, say but two elections will yeah, pass ahead, before Jason. we actually get a remedy. I'm sorry. Say again, please. Two elections will pass. 2022 yeah. election is going to move forward with these proposed maps and likely 24 by the time we hear back from the courts. Yeah. I wanted to follow up, uh, Jeff Brandis, by asking uh, when you say they end up in court, there were so there was a lawsuit filed in state court in Leon County and then it was withdrawn. And now there is a court date set in federal court, you know, before three judges in May. Uh, is that likely where this will all end up? Absolutely. A hundred percent. This is going to end up in court. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I think, you know, anybody who's betting would be all in to, to bet that this is going to be in court. But the question is, can we on, on its good, on a faith, uh, on a good faith effort, believe that this is, these are constitutional maps. I think the governor has, has put forth maps. At least our committee staff is telling us that they're constitutional. The chairman of the committee believes they're constitutional. Uh, and so going forward with only one map to vote on that we hear as constitutional, uh, we have to kind of take them at their word that they are, that they believe they are constitutional. I am not an attorney. I do not look at the maps every day and, and try to determine what is constitutional, and what's not. But I do rely on the good faith effort of those who work with us every day uh, and and their expert legal opinions as we go forward here. And you know what else there is, is this very complicated mathematical calculation. And if uh, the, in the governor's transmittal letter this week, his uh, counsel backed it up with all of the graphs and all of the charts where they calculated the compactness of the district. Jason, if, if it is to be believed, and there's no reason, frankly, not to believe the mathematical calculations that they put there, the governor's map does seem to make things more compact by the numbers which is in the Florida Constitution. Does that matter? It matters if you're if you're doing the look over here, look over here. But in places I don't think that are uh, and I don't know that most viewers are, are con concerned, you know, today, this morning, watching this program about Polk, Collier and Hendry County. But they should be, because when it's all about focusing on this district up in northeast Florida and really what does it mean for our, our southeast region districts, um, I, I think there are going to there are going to be issues. And I, I just I, I can't accept the same sort of premise about acting in good faith. Maybe it's because I have a law degree and a finance degree. But I, I, I think the math works uh, when you want it to work, when it when it goes unchallenged, which it most certainly will be. And it's glaring and objectively just worse. 
it, it's it's worse for representation and, and it's it's in runs in firm of, of the tenants that we have. Yeah. All right. We are speaking with State Senators Jason Pizzo of North Miami and Jeff Brandis of St. Petersburg. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We are glad you are with us on this Easter Sunday, Passover and Ramadan with Senator Jeff Brandis of St. Petersburg and Senator Jason Pizzo of North Miami. Uh, gentlemen, as you well know, this special session is called Just on Redistricting. But Senator Brandis, you have been the leading proponent, the leading voice saying that we ought to be talking about property insurance. Explain your position. Why, why is that so critical? Listen, there was a number of bills left on the table uh, during this legislative session dealing with making housing more affordable, uh, dealing with the condo collapse, and frankly, dealing with property insurance. And I believe that property insurance is really the number one crisis facing the state of Florida right now. Uh, we've lost an insurance company a month for the last four months. Uh, in fact, we, lost, we had one downgraded just on Friday, and they can currently no longer write federally backed mortgages. And so, you know, we're, we're in imminent collapse uh, in a variety of different areas. Even citizens property insurance is growing by about 6,000 policies a week right now. Yeah. And so what you have is the private market that's pulling out of the state. They're shrinking. Every single company uh, of the kind of admitted smaller carriers of the state of Florida shrank, shrank last year in market share. Citizens has now doubled almost in, in the last year and a half. And, and that's just not sustainable for the state of Florida. Uh, and we're very concerned about what, what this means going into hurricane season, which starts June 1st. And you are not alone in calling it the most pressing issue of the state right now. Uh, four days of session. I think we're all in agreement that this is not going to happen this week. But the governor this week did say he was all for a special session on property insurance. If the legislature could come in with a framework of workable ideas. Jason, what are the ideas on the table now? Well, there are a number of them. Some of them may seem like tough love measures, perhaps. Uh, but I, I'll tell you, this is not sort of a Johnny come lately situation. Senator Brandis, um, my roommate in Tallahassee, actually, uh, has been at the forefront of this for a while and sounding the call. It's very icky, I think, for, for some people or parties to discuss issues that, that might have some costs associated with it or, or some learning curve, whether it's reserves and, and stress tests and, and, and viability and where dollars are being directed. Um, that's one condo reforms another, uh, but um, this is something that's sort of a nonpartisan issue. It should should be a nonpartisan issue. It does get complicated uh, by it. Yeah. So, Tom, excuse me for one second. Uh, Tom Fabricio, the rep from Miramar, who uh, is heavily into crafting some of this framework, this week told me that he considers fraud, people gaming the system, the cost of litigation as the a number one problem in controlling the cost, that seems to put the onus on consumers and, and possibly that's where it should go. But, but Jeff Brandis, what about the insurance companies? Is the onus on them in certain ways to really come up with something or lawmakers come up with something that insurance companies from out of state who are, who are undercapitalized? I mean, what, what is the issue there? Well, frankly, the insurance companies just don't want to sell property insurance in Florida because of the amount of fraud and litigation that goes on here. Florida will see over 100,000 lawsuits this year in property insurance. And for every other state around the country, it's less than 1,000. So what we have to do is fundamentally realign incentives, allow people to price their policies in their pocketbooks. We've got to fix citizens property insurance. The most pressing issue is the reinsurance crisis that we're facing. Most of the property insurance companies in Florida are thinly capitalized. They rely heavily on reinsurance in order to, to, to get enough capacity to sell into the state. Uh, and that reinsurance pricing has gone through the roof if they can find it at all. And so that's immediately what's pressing. Then we've got to allow some more flexibility, which would be to allow for higher deductibles or allow for actual cash value on people's roofs. Listen, when you go out and if you have a 10 year old car and you get into a car accident, your insurance company will replace the car, but it doesn't buy you a brand new car. It gives you the money with, of the value of the car. Unfortunately, in Florida, we buy people brand new roofs. What's going on in Florida today is you and I are buying our neighbor's roofs and we're paying for it at higher premiums. Yeah. Uh, Jason Pizzo, let's go to another topic near and dear to you, and that is condo reform, structural safeness, safety. Uh, the uh, Champlain Tower South is in your district. You were there almost every day, I know, after it collapsed. And there was an attempt in the last legislative session to craft a bill which would have 
created a number of reforms, inspections sooner, recertification, and so on. Uh, what about a special session on condo safety and reform? This is uh, an issue that uh, Representative Perez in the House has worked hard on, as well as Senator Bradley in the Senate. There has been an impasse on two issues that remain uh, sort of, uh, you know, stalemating this effort, but I think we're very, very close. The governor indicated he would also accept a special session on this issue. What we'd like to do is run them concurrent with property insurance. The re it's uh, based on reserves and a couple of other issues uh, as it relates to condos, but I, but I think they're very, very close and I appreciate their efforts. Um, but, but again, and, and I know viewers watching, you know, for you, Bana and Michael, when Senator Brandis is talking about property insurance or we're talking about condo reform, these are the things we should have been working on during session, right? I mean, these, these are the things that it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican or NPA, black, white, rich, poor, coastal, inland. These are the things we should have been working yeah. on. Well, these, these, these are critical issues. I mean, was too much time spent on these culture war issues, which the governor and some other Republican leaders were, were pushing? I mean, is that why you didn't get to condo reform? Uh, that's a very rhetorical question. It's an overwhelming yes. We were completely, you know, consumed by, by, by crap. That, that has nothing to do with improving your life, your safety, your neighborhood, nothing. That's so, what we spent time doing. We didn't even get the budget done on time. Yeah. So you mentioned, Jason, you mentioned the, the reserves uh, is something that the, the Senate really got stuck on and uh, the House was ready to go. Just so everybody knows, that sticking point was uh, the House v version of this bill wanted to make mandatory reserves, a certain percentage mandatory for condo associations to keep in the bank. Uh, the Senate didn't want that. It would be hugely expensive for homeowners, maybe an unintended cost. But that's a very big deal in the specific Champlain Tower South issue is that there mm -hmm. were not enough reserves to do what needed to be done to keep that building now that we know up. So, Jeff Brandis, I mean, that that is a the, that reserve issue. That's a big one, is it not? It's huge. In fact, I would imagine most of the condos in the state of Florida don't have enough reserves to cover what their entire um, what their entire maintenance cost would be. It's one of those things we're going to have to take a bite out of and 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 actually address. It, absolutely, it's critical, um, but we can't bankrupt people in the process. And so I think that's the key: is like what's a meaningful amount of reserves uh, that we allow? Uh, what is the minimum amount of reserves that we allow? And and then go forward from there. But what we see is people just kind of waving all of their reserves and then hoping that you know what? Listen, I'm I'm either going to move or sell this condo. Uh, long before that bill comes due and we'll pass the buck on to somebody else. At some juncture, we have to take responsibility and realize that people have, you know, for decades have been ignoring the appropriate reserves in their condos. And now it's time to true up and, and actually put together a reasonable plan going forward. Jason, you're shaking your head. Why? Well, I'm nodding my head. Um, so oh, I'm not anyway. Nod is this way. Shake is this way. You were shaking. Shake is this way. This is nod. Yeah, I want to be uh, very clear. I, I just, but at the bottom rung of, of certain sort of economic situations, it is tantamount if you're inflexible about reserves, I believe, in displacing. We had this every year when vendors try to bring fire sprinkler install, installations and retrofits, that basically the special assessment was going to far outpace any, any mitigation of risk and lowering of premium. At the other end, you know, I proposed a bill and then therefore after an amendment that allowed for investment of some of these reserves. At the very least, my position is that you should not be able to, to waive reserves on structural issues, cosmetic, replacement, renovation, different situation, but, but not on structural. Again, you know, tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., I'm hopping on a flight to Tallahassee and I'll see Senator Brandis up there. Uh, but again, these are things that we could have and should have been working on, you know, to resolve we passed maps, going back to the, the opening segment, we passed maps legislatively that passed the smell test mm -hmm. that, you know, that were not gonna be challenged for House and for, and for State Senate. We, we could have and should have done the same for, you know, for others. Yeah, politics is difficult. Uh, Senators Jason Pezzo and Jeff Brandis, great to have you on. I wish the legislature sort of talked to each other frankly and honestly the way you did here this morning. Thanks very They're much. They're roommates. That's why they have practice. <laughs> thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Thank thanks. You.